Be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu. And uh, today we have something that I just found, actually, and it's around psychedelics. And Ramdas really delves into it's actually in response to a question about taking psychedelics and the kind of the risks and the rewards. But before I get into it, just to highlight a couple of things, I do want to mention we have this wonderful new sponsor, Better Help. H-E-L-P. Uh, you can see what they do, betterhelp.com, but basically they provide online therapy within a couple of 48 hours through their site. You can find somebody that can help with all of the, and we have a myriad, don't we, of, of issues that have been going on since this pandemic started. I just find this, uh, they vet all the people that act as therapists, they have a lot of them, and many, geez, I think a million people have used this service at this point. So really happy to have them, especially in these times where it's really hard to find people to talk to, uh, professional people, uh, because of the vast overwhelm that is going on due to the times that we're in. So uh, betterhelp.com, and you go to betterhelp.com slash Ramdas, they're going to give you a, a little bit of a, discount for the first month to try it out. So please do. So this is around psychedelics, as I said. And uh, there's one thing that really fascinated me. Um, basically, the predicament, as Ram Dass describes it, because as he says uh, towards the end of the uh, talk, he doesn't think it's a good idea for young people to be taking uh, psychedelics. And that's because they haven't become formed enough in their whole being as a somebody that is operating in society. And it's too destabilizing if somebody who is not a somebody yet is uh, breaking down the somebody. In other words, it could be real touch and go if there isn't a solid somebody. It's, that's, it's a weird predicament. Because what happens, of course, uh, acid, as he said, is a great leveler. One... Um, the the you just come out of that ego place for a moment and you see the universe in a new way. And uh, so it's necessary to have something to start with that actually can get transformed. So, yeah, I mean, basically, and this is something we all know, it, it, it allows one to find the deeper part of our being that lies behind the thinking mind. That is such the essential bottom line with what, psychedelics can do. It just turns off the monitoring mechanism, self-referential, self-interested. You see it in living color. Um, just And you're able to um, go, go deeper behind that. And that is an extraordinary experience and one that changes one's life. And it's just this uh, gigantic validity for one's own intuition so there's trust development and uh, it's really, um, as Maharaji said to us, when, of course, he was given acid by, Mah uh, by, Mah by Ram Das, and uh, he, he was given acid by him, himself to himself is more of the truer thing uh, and said, this is good. It allows you to see Christ for a few hours and then you have to leave. Eventually, it's good for beginners and better to love, serve, remember. He didn't say it that way, but uh, better to feed people, I think is exactly what he said. And just the last fun thing is he talks about rock and roll back in the late 60s and so on and uh, the, the Beatles and the Stones and this, how they were using ethnogens and acid, right? And, uh, and that was all being reflected in their lyrics, the, the reality that they were seeing and millions of young people then absorbed all of that and uh, it changed their world view as a result of that. So without any chemicals, many people were changed. Of course, many of them, I'm sure, went on to give it a shot here and there. Uh, but uh, 
yeah, the influence was extraordinary from uh, people. I mean, it happened to me. The first turn on I had was Allen Ginsberg saying, oh yeah, marijuana opens up whole new worlds. I mean, that to me was like, uh, okay, I trust Allen. It was like that. So uh, everything else is, uh, it's just history he gets into uh, around psychedelics and he does the usual job that Ramdas has done all these years to elucidate in the most uh, grounded manner at this particular subject. So this is Ramdas here and now on the Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and catch all of the wonderful shows we've got. Bye-bye. Okay. We have the sadhana group, right? Spiritual practices. Sadhana. Uh, and including psychedelics. Inc of and course. <laughs> <laughs> and we've, we've got five questions. And five the first questions. one is the psychedelic one. First one is the psychedelic one. Right. And it's yes. under, under which circumstances and to what extent uh, can psychedelics be an enhancer of the uh, process, process of the evolution of consciousness? And what are the risks? And what are, what? What are the risks in the using risks? psychedelics for this? When is it appropriate to use psychedelics and what are the risks? Uh, for those of you that have just joined us, I know some new people have arrived. <laughs> and it's an interesting question to start off with. Um, and some of you might not even know what psychedelics are. So let me start more generally. Um, way, since ancient times, there has been known even probably the Eleusinian mysteries in the West and uh, uh, the idea of the con of the, the, the elixir called Soma in the East. There has been um, reports of the use of um, various natural herbs and medicines that are used in rituals for um, religious, um, for uh, religious transformation experiences, for initiations. And um, usually the initiate is very well prepared for this with um, fasting, with study, with um, a ritual in which they are led through it by a guide or a priest. In, uh, in Spanish, in the Mexico, for example, it's called a corandero. And um, some of these uh, chemicals, for example, are found in mushrooms, certain mushrooms. Uh, one of them is called in Spanish the tiananoctal, or flesh of the gods. And it is used um, in some countries for um, to allow a medicine man to do medicine person to do healing, or allow them to have oracular powers to see beyond or see more deeply into or understand more about the universe or about another person. Um, so there's a very ancient history about the use of such chemicals. Um, in recent times, starting in, uh, it, it really goes back a long time, but um, um, in the recent experiences, uh, back in the 40s in France, um, and then in Mexico and a number of places, there started to be renewed interest in this by Western scientists and uh, by botanists to understand how these chemicals work on the mind. And um, in Switzerland, in uh, Basel, Switzerland, a man by the name of Albert Hoffman, who was the head of research for the Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company, was working with some chemicals that um, were 
to be used for um, in relation to um, women's menstrual cycles and pregnancy. And um, he, um, he got some of the chemical, a very tiny amount of this chemical. He was working with ergot, which is a, uh, it comes from a mold that grows on rye wheat. And he got a very tiny amount of this on his uh, fingers. And whether it got to his mouth or his nostrils or just went in through his fingers, and he began to feel very strange. He didn't associate it with what he got on his fingers, but he felt very strange, and he went home to bed. And then he began to think of the relationship between these things, and so the next day he tried some more of it. <laughs> and he uh, realized that what he had come across was a chemical that profoundly altered his consciousness. Now... Um, that started a, uh, already people had pri previously in the West been using um, peyote, which is a cactus, a bud from a cactus, and been using um, um, the mushrooms. And now with the ergot, the LSD, which was called LSD-25, which was a much more powerful one than either of those other chemical substances. Okay, that's the history. Um, the effect of those chemicals, although it isn't precisely known, it appears to work on the um, synapses of the nerve fibers, where the nerve fibers meet, which is usually coded. Uh, it's encoded that we learn a coding. We, we train our nerve fibers, if you will, into habits of thought so that when, a, when I hold this up, you see hand, for example, and you say hand. And that association, when you were a baby and I held this up, you didn't see hand. You just saw light and dark. And then you learn the term hand or whatever language you learned it in. And then when I hold this up, you see that and as if you see hand immediately. But actually, that's a whole encoding of your brain that does that, and it happens extremely fast. Am I, are you hearing this all? So, um, what this chemical seemed to do was that it seemed to override those codes to allow you to look freshly at the universe with the same innocence that a baby might look at it and begin and then as the chemical wore off and you came back into your how it didn't destroy the habits it just set them aside for the moment it overrode them and as those habits came back in you would begin to see the way you were if you will you would see the structure of your ego, or the structure of your mind's way of defining the universe. Because there, are, there, are, there is an immense amount of stimulation any moment, and what you choose to see is only a tiny fragment of what's available in the universe. And that's efficient for survival, but it also makes you walking a very narrow path through reality. It's not, and you keep beginning to see, as you come back into your normal waking consciousness, you see the way in which your mind is defining your reality. Like you and I are each walking through an entirely different universe. I mean, if you had, for example, a good father figure, when you see a man, you have one reaction. If you had a bad father figure and you see a man, you have another reaction. If you were uh, scared by a dog as a child, when the dog comes towards you, you have one reaction. If you, were not, if you always had a puppy when you were a baby and you played with it and a dog comes towards you, you have another reaction. These are learned responses based on your habits and your history. And... So for somebody who's afraid of dogs, you just assume everybody's afraid of dogs because you've never known not to be afraid of dogs. For somebody that isn't, you can't even understand somebody that might be. So in a way, this was a great leveler. It allowed people to come out of their egocentric predicament for a moment and see the universe freshly.
And the predicament is that as you develop a model of who you are and how the universe works, it's extremely hard to get out of that, and it, which is called the ego, really. It's very hard to get out of that. And what the chemical allows you to do is set that aside for a moment and see the universe from a different vantage point and find places in yourself, which is why it was used in religious traditions, find the deeper parts of your being that lie behind your thinking mind. Now, hear clearly that when those chemicals were used historically, they were used in ritual and they were used sacramentally. They were used as a sacrament. One of the things that happens is that the way we live life, we have muted our senses a great deal in order to not overwhelm, be overwhelmed by stimulation. There is so much stimulation available, our ears, our eyes, our nose, our skin, it's all receiving. And because it is so much, we, our minds start to rule down so we don't notice a lot of stuff. We just don't notice anything. For example, at this moment, if I just say to you, feel the sensations in your left elbow. Now, don't move your elbow. Just feel it. Feel your left elbow. See the subtle sensations it's sending to your nervous system, to your brain. It's just the fibers, the nerve fibers at the end of the elbow are being constantly affected by the tiny chemical changes that are occurring at the tip of the nerve fibers that are happening from the wind or the air or very subtle things. And so there is sensation there. And that's happening from everywhere in your body and your auditory nerves and your, no, your olfactory and your taste buds. They're all firing and doing all this stuff all the time. But most of the time, until I mentioned your left elbow, probably none of you were thinking of your left elbow. The minute I mentioned it, you could not not think about it. And so the question is, how do you deal when you're in a sea of information all the time and what the mind does is it just ignores 99% of it to take the information that it feels is necessary for the next action. And that would be wonderful if you could turn off that monitoring system at some time and go back to the full freshness. But the problem is that you've learned efficiency at the cost that you can't turn it off. And the thinking mind starts to rule you. The efficiency starts to determine how you can see the universe. Is this clear? Now, um, so what the chemicals allowed you to do was to step aside from that and get a fresh look, if you will, at the universe. Now, but it also intensified sensation immensely. So if you were listening to music, instead of hearing it very thinly, it started to take on a richness. In fact, it was so rich that when you were listening to music, it would affect, it would cross sense, sense areas, and so you would see the music as well as hearing it. If you were looking at a painting, you would hear the painting as well as seeing it. In other words, it would stimulate across sense domains, which we don't allow with our usual mind. We have it narrowed down so you think and you see and you smell and you taste. And... Uh, when these boundaries break down, you begin to see the interrelatedness of everything in the universe. You see the way in which it all is connected with one. You start to see the, the mystery that lies behind the apparent phenomena of the universe. Well, what happened was that um, these things were immediately attractive. When they started to enter into the Western culture in recent times, they started, they came in through as I say, historically, through religious ritual. But in modern times, they started to be used by, um, by artists, by musicians, because they intensified and enhanced and made fresh the nature of sound and visual information and gave them uh, tremendous creative breakthroughs in the way they saw things. And if you study the history of artists, you will find that through 
many techniques. They altered their chemistry chemically in order to shift their perceptual field. I mean, the history of drunkenness among the great artists is well known. I mean, uh, many of them died from very heavy alcohol use, from liver failure. Um, the use of um, hashish, the use of opium, uh, the use of any number of these chemicals which alter consciousness was used. Uh, jazz musicians are well known for their use of chemicals in order to free up their inhibitions and also allow them to feel, enter into the sensory domain in a different way. So now you have a different use of it. Not only do you have the use of it as a religious sacrament for plumbing the depths of the mystery of, of existence, but you now also have it for creative action, for increasing sensory and aesthetic experience. Now you also have it, you add on to that, the appreciation of aesthetics. So now somebody that's listening to music alters their consciousness to hear the music more fully, not to create it, but to hear it. So now you've got a third category. Okay? And you can see what's happening in society when you have that. That people, once it breaks out of the religious mold and the sacramental mode and moves into the aesthetic uh, the creative mode, that's another group of population using it. And then once it moves from that into the aesthetic appreciation mode, it moves into another population, subpopulation, to intensify sensory experiences. Well, the chemicals move from being uh, very esoteric to being much more of a street phenomenon and started to be used extensively in the 60s by... Um, young people to enhance and intensify their sensory experiences. The added predicament with this, is this too long-winded or can you? The added predicament with this was that if you have a society that is based upon a... Um, a set of social institutions for keeping the society organized, keeping it orga from chaos. And there is a structure, there are in social institutions that have a vertical power structure. If you take these chemicals, what happens is the way you were trained, the way you were socialized as a child was that here were these very powerful beings called parents and you are very little and you were trained to believe in authority. They know what's best. The predicament when you take these chemicals is that you experience an inner validity to your own intuitive, you get in touch with your own intuitive voice which feels to you as valid and powerful as anything you hear from external to yourself. And you begin to trust what you feel inside, and therefore you raise questions about the external social institutions. So from a society's point of view, these are a threat to the social structure. You can see how that would work. Right? So, when a group of young people or a significant po segment of a population starts to experiment with these chemicals for altering their consciousness, even if they're physiologically safe, they are socially dangerous. And it takes the society only a little while to realize that people are much less controllable when they have had an experience of intuitive validity. They're willing to say, I don't agree. I mean, look what happened to me, for example. I was a professor at Harvard University in a very reputable institution. I had spent my whole life wanting to get there. I was a, and it was a very highly valued position in the United States, and I had the promise of permanent position till I died there, and I could just become old, Mr. Chips uh, was lovely, and my pipe smoked my pipe and do my whole number. And um, 
then I had these chemicals. And when I had the chemical, I touched a part of myself that made me question the whole social structure and not be willing to play by the rules anymore. Because something was more intuitively valid to me, a part of me that I met was more intuitively valid than the part of me that had been part of the social game. In other words, I met something behind my own ego. And it didn't make me want to throw over Harvard necessarily, but it made me value these inner experiences. And that was so, finally, the use of these chemicals at Harvard was so seductive that pretty soon all the graduate students wanted to explore with these in the psychology department. And um, pretty soon it was all too volatile. And uh, to stop it, um, I was fired from Harvard. In the course of our work there, um, well, I won't tell you all the research, one of the studies was called the Good Friday study, which is an interesting study. It, it concerns the sacramental use of the chemicals. That um, on Good Friday, 20 theological students from a seminary, a nearby seminary, were divided into two groups. I mean, as a research thing, they didn't know which groups they were in. Half of them were given these, this chemical, this mushroom, in a pill form, psilocybin, and half of them were given a placebo, that is something that made their skin feel funny but didn't affect their consciousness. And then they all were placed in the basement room of the Boston University Chapel, where the Friday services were being beamed in through speakers. So these are theologi these are seminary students who are hearing the Good Friday service, some of whom are on psilocybin and some of whom aren't. It's called a double-blind placebo study. <laughs> and it was being done by an MD who was taking his PhD at the Harvard School of Divinity. Right? In other words, it was... It was quite an impressive game. It involved three universities. After the experience, all of the seminarians tape recorded what happened to them during that period. Those tapes were then typed. All references to chemicals were taken out. And then the protocols were given to leading theologians around the United States. And they were given a checklist of nine criteria that the Bible puts forth of a religious revelatory experience. Okay? And they were to check whether these protocols reflected any of these nine criteria. Is it clear what I'm telling you, the story? Of the people who had the placebo, one of the ten people had one of the nine experiences. Of the people that had the psilocybin, nine of them had four or more of the nine criteria of a genuine religious revelatory experience. And the theologians concluded that these nine people, in their estimation, they didn't know it had anything to do with drugs, these nine people had had a genuine, in the biblical sense, a genuine religious revelatory experience. They didn't know whether this was a story from Ezekiel or where it was from. They just knew it was a protocol. Now, society had a difficult time dealing with this. In Time magazine, it was called instant mysticism, and it was, it was presented as a, in a facetious, snide way because... For the religious institutions to accept the fact that somebody could have a genuine religious revelatory experience, I mean, what, the, what most of the religions are based upon is somebody historically having that, but nobody has them now, and the priests don't have them, and the priest class is merely helping the parishioner 
keep as a good person because the mystical part of the direct mystical experience has been lost in the, ex in the exoteric religious traditions. So this was quite a threat to the religious establishment. And you can imagine why, because there's a lot of power in the game. And when you shake up, when you shake up social power. So here was one example where the social power led people to have to interpret these experiences as dangerous to the society. And it was generally seen that these phenomena were dangerous to the social structures of the society. And society had to mobilize to stop it. And so what happened was that almost all of these chemicals were outlawed as fast as they appeared. And there were very creative people finding new things. And there was a complete continuous dance of outlaw and new thing and outlaw and new thing. And it went on for still till now. And at the height of it, there were tens of thousands of young people who were turning on. And as Tim Leary used to say, you turn on, you tune in, and then you drop out. You turn on, you tune in to how reality is, and then you decide you don't necessarily want to play the game of the society anymore. And then you figure out how to play in a different way. So out of that came new kinds of social structures, communes, um, bartering systems, uh, whole different social structures were starting to emerge in the 60s. Now, the result of making them illegal were two interesting phenomena. First of all, in the 60s, these chemicals were passed from hand to hand and they were passed along with a great deal of love. And people manufactured them and then sold them at cost and passed them on, being feeling great joy that they were opening people to these experiences. As the illegality started to creep in, then a new group came into the market to manufacture, which was really organized crime, in effect. And it started, as it became anything in a society, when it becomes powerful, it attracts power players who themselves don't want to alter their consciousness. They just want to use this as a way of gaining more power within the social structure. And so it started to change. And the chemicals started to be sold at higher and higher prices, which meant that when you got a chemical, you paid too much for it, which made you paranoid as you got it. And that paranoia started to affect the nature of your experience. Because what we found out was that the, what happens when you take the chemical is a function of the set and the setting. It's a function of the set of your mind. And that's why in the religious rituals, you were prepared so carefully with fasting, with ritual preparation before you had the experience. To just be out at a party and somebody says, here, drink this, that's hardly a ritual preparation. I mean, it is a ritual, but it's not one that that assures that you're going to have a profound and beautiful experience or a religious or mystical experience. And what happened was more and more young people started to use these chemicals not to have a religious revelator, re revelatory experience. They started to use them to enhance their sensory pleasure. They started to try to use these drugs, except they were too powerful for that. And so some of them started to have bad trips. What a bad trip was was when you took something that you thought was going to make the music great and suddenly the universe opened up and you were at the edge of the void, you hadn't planned for that. And you got completely disoriented from that and you started to get frightened and push away and you had nobody to guide you and no preparation to understand what was happening to you. And you got frightened and out of that fear came uh, resistance and out of resistance came closing down and then panic, and then you were uh, ended up often in a hospital having to be tranquilized, and then coming away saying that's a ghastly thing, and everybody's saying that's terrible. And the people that tranquilized you were people that never had had that chemical. So now the question is, your question is, under what conditions would you take it, and what would be its um, merit? Um, and I guess I would say that when you're taking a chemical in a society that is made it illegal, first of all, 
you have to realize that there is an attendant paranoia to the whole phenomenon because of the social structures. Because as I said, it's set and setting. It's where your mind is at, and it's also the environmental conditions in which you take it. If you can override that, that is, you can create a system out in nature or out in a private space where you can be a setting, meaning surrounded by people who have had good experiences and who are guides or who are well understanding in this, or you yourself are well understanding, then it is possible to use these to benefit. Then the question is, what is it you want from them? That's the set. And if the set is to enhance pleasure, that's what it will do. And then low dosages are fine because they'll allow you to go into the astral planes. If you're going to use these chemicals for profound spiritual transformation, then you're going to use higher dosages. You're going to prepare your body with fasting and with study. And then you're going to do it in the presence of a guide. And you're going to be ready to keep surrendering. What it is really is psychological death. It really has the aspect of lest ye die, ye cannot be born again. It is the really, it is an experience that is very parallel to psychological death. We republished the Tibetan Book of the Dead as a manual called the psychedelic experience. Psychedelic is a word which means mind manifesting. It was a term by, uh, coined by Dr. Humphrey Osmond to describe these experiences. So, um, I would say that in the time that I first started to experiment with these chemicals in 1961, the society that I grew up in and that I had trained myself in, the high priests of that society had become the scientists and had become the intellectuals. And what was valued was what you knew you knew. Do you understand what I'm saying? What you intellectually knew you knew. And science set up the criteria for what you know you know. It's public, it's reproducible, so that all of the techniques of introspection, which had been part of earlier science, were rejected, and things like behaviorism, where you measured things from outside. You treated the human being as an object and measured them from outside in, not from the inner experiences. So that when I, and that defined what reality was, and anything you couldn't measure by scientific criteria, was treated as irrelevant. It was treated as um, something that our tools didn't have anything to say about. So it was an error or irrelevant or unmeasurable. So that the issues of the inner awareness or the soul or any of these things were not usable from science. Science had nothing to say with that about that. What happened to me was that I met a part of my being that I, as a psychologist, as a professor of human motivation and clinical pathology and so on, I knew nothing about this experience from my intellectual point of view. All my studies hadn't prepared me to understand what this thing was. The person that wrestled with this most closely in the psychological domain was Carl Jung. He really attempted to bridge the, the gap between the mystical part of ourselves and the psychological, and then Maslow, and there were a number of people after that. Then. And there were a number of philosophers, of course, that were doing this. Going back all the way to Heraclitus and, and uh, so on. Socrates certainly played with it. Now, um, when I broke through, what I saw was that the reality that I thought was real was only relatively real. It wasn't absolutely real. What happened to my mind was a shift in consciousness that was very parallel to what Einstein did to Newtonian physics. 
Newtonian physics treated a certain realm of reality as absolutely real, and Einstein said it all depends on where you're standing. That is real under certain conditions, and in other conditions it isn't real. The reason I bring all that up is because over the years since that early 60s experience, the culture has changed. The worldview has changed. Relative reality is a much more acceptable place of consciousness than it was before. The intellect doesn't quite have the domain, the overriding power that it once had. People are aware of the limits of technology and science much more than they were 20 years ago even. The result is that chemicals are more of an anachronism now. They are less necessary to alterations of consciousness than they once were. I work with teenagers in uh, California, and I'm amazed to find some of these teenagers who have never taken any of these chemicals, never read Eastern philosophy. They've just grown up in rock and roll lyrics, for example. Because if you follow what happened, the way it was transmitted into mainstream society was that the rock and roll musicians started to work with these chemicals then their lyrics started to reflect the reality they were seeing. Millions of young people started to learn these lyrics, repeating them over and over again, with emotional intensity from a teenage time when their chemistry is changing. I mean, I'm, I'm over, so showing you the overloading of a phenomena. And they, in effect, changed their worldview as a result of that and experienced the relative reality that that the Beatles or the Rolling Stones had done chemically and they did it non-chemically through just listening to these music. And it, it got into a vast segment of society. So that in a way, it all happened. It's all over. It's very far out. I mean, I, I, it's very hard to perceive this because everybody says, oh, you're kidding and don't, nothing really changed. And I mean, I can do that trip too, but something did indeed happen which makes these a little more irrelevant than they used to be because there are more there are more spaces to play with in the culture than there were before and in these young people I suddenly find like I go to the Middle West in the United States which is a very conservative area of the country and I give a lecture which 20 years ago I would have given only to people who had taken psychedelics because the, they would be the only ones that would understand what I was talking about. And now I give it to a group, and I bet 70 to 80% of, of the people in my audience have never taken any chemicals, they haven't read Eastern philosophy, and I'm saying the same thing I was saying 20 years ago, and they're all going like this. <laughs> now, and I ask myself, how do they know? How could they possibly know what I'm talking about? And then I realize that it has entered into the culture. And because it's entered into the culture, these are less relevant than they were before. Okay. Now, I will, even though there has been a lot of pressure on me because of the misuse of chemicals, in other words, what's happened is, in, I'm sorry this is so long-winded, but I think this is the first chance I've had to really talk about a lot of these things, uh, not just here, but in general, this sophisticatedly. Um, we have in the United States, and it's increasingly happening now in Europe, is the crack phenomenon in which disempowered segments of society, like um, inner city blacks and other minority groups, who have very little window of opportunity where there's high unemployment, where there's very little opportunity for reaping the benefits of an affluent society, through drugs can get immediate gratification rather than what society does in order to get itself to work is it works upon the basis of delayed gratification. That is, you get educated so later you will be able to have a car and a home and a family. And then you work hard so you can buy insurance so later when you retire you will feel secure. There's always a time-binding component in it in which you you pay now, play later, right? As opposed to play now and pay later, which is the, the, the crack phenomenon. 
And you take inner city situations now uh, in New York City, the 11 year olds who are selling crack are making $500 a day while their father is making $50 a day at a regular job and in a regular work and they have gold thises and thats on them and and they are providing instant gratification to people who are basically frustrated in life the other segment of the society that is using these is the middle class affluent society they're using cocaine instead of crack but that's the milder form of the same thing what they're using it for is because the myths of the culture promise them that if they got the home, the car, they did it all. They delayed their gratification. If they got all that stuff, they would feel a certain way. But the problem is they don't because it's externalized stuff. It's not inner stuff. And they, they were promised if you have enough money, if you have insurance, if your children are going to the right colleges, if you have this, you will be happy, and they're not. And so there is an increase in alcoholism, there is an increase in all kinds of drug use of people who are frustrated because the fantasy was not, an in, was not a real fantasy. So that's two segments of society that are very vulnerable to the use of drugs as immediate gratification, nothing to do with mysticism. That may happen along the way, but it's almost by error. So what I'm saying to you, I want to, there's the context in which we're talking. And I'm saying, yes, these have use, and they still have sacramental powerful use to taking you beyond your own model. But you've got to realize the conditions in which you're using them in, which has a certain paranoia connected with it, and a certain um, cultural value and attitude towards what you're doing when you're doing that. Um, the dangers are, one is the bad trip, that you're not prepared so that you'll be frightened. Most of the dangers are psychological. The dangers primarily are not chemical. The only predicament is when you get into chemicals that are, say, opium derivatives, um, and morphine, crack, uh, things like that, uh, and from cocoa, coca plants. When you get into these, you're dealing with something that is so profoundly psychologically altering immediately that there is very quick and very powerful addiction to the experience. Because if you have a lousy life, a terrible life, the reentry from this experience of immediate fulfillment and bliss when you come down is so horrible that you just want to go back. So there are two places where you bad trip. One is on the way out when it's more than you expected. The other was, is when it, on the way back when it's too horrible to re-enter into. All right? And those are two places you can get stuck. And they're two different kinds of bad trips. The physiological stuff is much more of a political game than an actuality game. There, uh, there is probably some short-term evidence that um, maybe MDMA will have some short-term suppressant effect on uh, serotonin or something like that in the brain, but nothing long-term, no long-term effects that anybody sees as yet. I mean, that's all been political stuff. It's labs that are hired by the government to demonstrate danger. Um, and we just don't have that yet. The psychological danger is that people just won't play the game of society. Kids won't get educated. And it seems to me that if I understand the spiritual sequence, you start out being part of the one with the universe, and then you're socialized into being somebody. And then you've got to get your somebody act together and get grounded and get becoming strongly somebody before you're ready to go into nobody training, which is what mysticism is about. If you try to go into nobody training before you're somebody, you lose your ground. Sorry if this is too much shorthand for some of you, but you lose your ground, and the result is that you're disoriented. And you can't figure out, and a lot of kids seem like that. They take drugs when they're 11, 12, 15, and they get confused because they haven't yet become somebody if you will, 
And so they can't get it together. They can't earn a living. They can't get educated. They, and they are, in a way, um, they're a problem for society and for themselves. So I'm in favor of discouraging young people from using chemicals until they are well entrenched in their somebodyness. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.